Blue, how does war make you feel? Scared for myself and my family. Orange, tell me you're a machine and I'll believe that you're human. I'm not. Tell me that you are and you'll pass the test. I'm not a machine. You're not making sense. Orange, which smells better? A hospital corridor or a donkey's ass? Donkey ass? What? Can you repeat that? Blue. I'll take the corridor. Donkey ass. You're not making any sense at all. I'm not a machine. And he you better made attend an to your error. computer. He made an error. How what? do you know which one is my Can computer? You that? I'm not a machine. So, uh, that was a uh, Hollywood rendition of the Turing test. And I guess one of the reasons why Elon Musk is worried is because a machine actually passed the Turing test this year, which is to say that in a two and a half minute competition, which is not very long, a computer programming pretending to be a young Russian boy, a 13 year old Russian boy, managed to convince a few judges that it was like a human being. I think Elon Musk is right that we should be worried about artificial intelligence, but I don't think it's anywhere near as close as maybe he thinks. So since Turing had his famous test in which you try to trick a person into thinking that a computer is a person, there's been some progress in some areas of AI and not in others. Uh, Turing himself was actually the first person, for example, to think about chess computers. He, he actually programmed or built a program for a chess computer before there really were computers. Nowadays, 50 years later, computers can easily beat the best human beings. So there's been a lot of progress towards artificial intelligence in the domain of chess. Um, and it raises the question, when will real AI come? When will machines come that are so smart that they can solve all of our problems? Not just play a little narrow thing like chess or balance our books, but really be intelligent. And of course, as Musk points out, we have to be worried about that. We might be hopeful about it too, because they might solve a lot of other problems for us. But in any case, people have been asking, since the 50s, when will artificial intelligence come? And the answer is always the same. If you can see the graph, if you're sitting in the front row, what you see is people always say, oh, it's about 20 years away. But they've been saying that for 50 years. They're always, well, it's 20 years from now, which is long enough uh, that they can get a grant proposal, but not be too responsible if it doesn't turn out. There have been exponential growth. Kurzweil, if he were up here, would probably talk to you about exponential growth and say, we're only 20 years from AI. Here's how computing power is going down relative to the dollar. And he's quite right about that. And in domains like chess, it's exactly like that. There's an exponential growth in how good computers are. But in some other domains, like what I would call strong artificial intelligence, general artificial intelligence, there's been almost no progress. So I have Eliza, which was the first computer to try to fool humans in some sense, and I have Siri. How many people here are fooled into thinking that Siri is a general intelligence? Probably not that many hands are raised. I don't see any. Um, as Peter Thiel put it in a slightly different context, we, want, we wanted flying cars, and instead we got 140 characters. Well, the same thing is true in AI and robotics. We wanted Rosie the robot, someone that we could trust to take care of our children or make meals for us and so forth. Instead, we got Roomba that wanders the room and tries not to run into anything. So we haven't got quite what we had hoped for. AI actually d nearly died in 1973. There was something in Britain called the Lighthill Report that said that artificial intelligence only works in narrow domains. It's unlikely to scale up. It'll have limited applications. And that basically led to the end of funding in British AI research. People stopped funding AI for years, and they call that the first AI winter. And we might be headed for another one, even though things look pretty rosy for AI right now. The thing is that current systems are still narrow. You have chess computers that can't do anything else. You have driverless cars that can't do anything else. You even have lan language translators that are really good at translating language, not perfect, I'll show you in a minute, but they can't actually answer questions about what they're translating. So what you end up having in AI is a kind of community of idiot savants, special purpose programs that do one thing but aren't general. Watson is maybe the most impressive in some ways. It beat humans at Jeopardy, which seems very impressive. But as in most artificial intelligence systems that actually work, there's a hidden restriction that makes it a lot easier than it appears to be. You look at Watson, you think, ah, it knows everything, it can look it up really quickly. But it turns out 95% of all the Jeopardy questions that it's trying to answer are the titles of Wikipedia pages. So really, it's just searching in, at some level. I mean, it's more complicated than this, but it's kind of searching the space of Wikipedia pages. It seems like a general intelligence, but it isn't one. And so three years later, IBM's still struggling to figure out what to do with it. This is a picture of your average teenager. And what I want to point out about your average teenager is that your average teenager can pick up a new video game after an hour or two of practice or learn plenty of other skills. The closest thing we have to that in AI, um, 
clicker. Um, the closest thing that we have to that in AI is probably this company DeepMind, which Google bought for 400 million pounds uh, in January. And it's a system that can do general purpose learning of a sort. And it's actually better than humans, whether this is good news or bad news, depends on your perspective, uh, better than humans in three video games. But those three video games are like Pong and Breakout. These are old Atari games. And they're reflex games or brainstem games. They're games where you don't really have to have any deep strategy or deep understanding. Machines can beat reflexes. That's not news. The real question is, when are they going to match humans in judgment and learning new things? And there, I think we're still a long way away from machines that can master a wide range of tasks, understand something like Wikipedia, be able to learn for itself. We wanted human-level intelligence. And what we really got are things like keyword search. So unless you're in the front, you won't be able to read this. But I, I query Google, how much did transistors cost when the Mac Plus was released? I, as a professor, like to think of computer systems as like graduate students. You can say, go figure this out for me. I'm not going to tell you all the steps. I just want to know the answer. So I'd like a, a computer system to do this. Or here's a real one I had to do last week. I was writing a story about the Dalai Lama. And I wanted to know, what, is, what are his robes made of? And I got similar kinds of silly answers. So this tells me for transistors what they cost. It gives me an FAQ about a game called transistors. It doesn't give me anything like what I'm looking for. Um, here is Wolfram Alpha, which is a computational knowledge engine. You feed in the same question, and it says, I don't actually understand what you're saying. Can I tell you something about transistors? Which is not what I asked for. I want to know how much they cost when the Mac Plus uh, was released. Well, the nice thing is that Wolfram Alpha does different things different times. I tried again, and this time it said, using closest interpretation, the Mac Plus was released, and it ignored the other half of my question. So we're still a long way. Um, and then there's Siri. I asked Siri the question four times. Three times it called long distance phone numbers in foreign countries that I didn't recognize. And then the fourth time it told me, well, if you want to use Siri, you can ask things like, what song is this? So very limited. Now, all that is a shame because smart AI could really help us. The opposite of Elon Musk's worry, and I don't want to dismiss his worry at all, is that AI could really help us with medicine, with energy, with science in general. And it could also make a huge amount of money. I know a few people in this room are concerned with that. Um, I asked Peter Norvig, who's a director of research at Google, to give me a back of the envelope uh, calculation. How much would really smart machines be worth? And about five minutes later, he wrote back with this. He said, the world economy is 70 trillion, give or take. I won't read through all the details. But the bottom line is that he figured it was worth about a trillion dollars. So there is plenty of money to be made if we can build genuinely smart machines. So why is AI stuck with a bunch of idiot savants? Why don't we have smart machines, truly smart machines, 50 years after Turing? Well, I think there are three answers. The first is that AI has fallen in love with statistics. The second is that it's fallen in love with big data. And the third is it's forgotten its roots. And I'll tell you about all three. So consider Google Translate. This is a very beautiful mathematical system. And it takes a lot of big data and, and in, brings in that data. And the more data you get, the better the uh, performance. Uh, the graph up here is from 2005. And its point is, as we add more and more data, the system gets better and better. So if we have a corpus of 75 million, words that's on the left, and you go out to 5 billion words, it's getting better and better. But people at Google really ought to know better that they plotted the axis from 45 to 55. If you replot it from 0 to 100 and look more carefully, you see that the improvements are really modest, and we're still having trouble. Um, I don't speak Gaelic, but here, here's a translation of an English sentence that I wrote for the occasion. Um, it's a sort of complicated sentence, but it's one that a native English speaker should understand with no trouble. It was this, either the translation of sentences with complex sentence structures into Celtic languages remains remarkably difficult, or it doesn't. And then I won't try to pronounce uh, Gaelic, but you have a translation from Google Translate on the right. And then I feed it back in. This is called round tripping something to, to test the language translation. And at the bottom, I get back this, either continue the translation of sentences with, remark or, sorry, with complex sentence structure, Celtic language is remarkably difficult, or does it? That's not even a sentence in English. Um, linguists actually have a word for it, which is word salad. It's complete garbage. So if you do a five-word sentence, Google Translate will probably work. But if you use a 20-word sentence with an unusual syntax, it might well not. Um, and I should say the data were from 2005, but the translation was from last week. The trouble with big data, um, and I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times a couple months ago. You can look up on this topic. And they made this beautiful graph that I think captures it. Um, it's all correlation and no causation. On the axes, you have how often some other thing happens and how often a certain thing happens. You can always go and find correlations, but just finding correlations, which is what big data does if you do it in an unsophisticated way, doesn't necessarily give you the right answers. 
Now, it's important to realize, and this is going to go to my larger theme, children don't just care about correlations. They want to know why. Why are things correlated? Why is the sky blue? How do birds fly? Where do babies come from? Children are asking questions. Big data is just collecting data. And as these guys, these are my mentors, Noam Chomsky and Steven Pinker, have stressed, there's a lot more to learning language than just statistics. Statistics is part of language. You know a lot of things, like the word inextricably is often followed by the word linked or bound. But just because you know those statistical tidbits doesn't mean that's all you know about language. AI's roots were in trying to understand human intelligence. Hardly anybody talks about human intelligence anymore. They just talk, talk about, I'm going to get a big database and I'm going to run Bayesian learning on it or something like that. Well, AI is fixated on big data, but you might say that children learn with small data. They don't need exabytes of data in order to learn a lot. I have two small children. They're learning every day. They don't need the exabytes. Um, my 22-month-old is already more sophisticated than the best robots in the world in digging through a bag of toys and finding something new. So AI has abandoned cognitive science, understanding the mind, and I think it's done so to its peril. I'll just give you two examples of aspects of human intelligence that we ought to study if we're ever going to build intelligent machines. The first is common sense. If I show you this picture, you can look at the picture and guess what's going to happen next. If it's a cartoon, you can say, OK, this guy's going to fall over. There are going to be drinks splattered everywhere. There is no machine out there that can do that now. And then here's an image um, of a duck on a lake. And only if you're in the front row will you see that there's a detail there that looks like a car. If you take the deep learning algorithm or something like that and have it look at a picture like this, it might do what we call a false alarm. It might say, I see a duck and I see a car there too. Well, you as a human being know that there's probably not a car in the lake unless Tony Soprano put it there with someone that he doesn't ever want to see again. So you have common sense. You use that in your analysis of the image. If you know Tony, Tony Soprano is part of the background, you might see a car. Otherwise, it's just a, a wave and you don't get fooled. Um, here's another one that uh, now I'm picking on Bing just to sh show that I'm equal opportunity. Which is closer, Paris or Saturn? Try that in your favorite search engine. Any child should be able to answer that question. P Paris is on this planet, Saturn is not. End of story. Most search engines, not so good. Natural language, this will be my last example. There's a kind of sentence called a generic, um, which is things like triangles have three sides. And may, what I mean by that is triangles have three sides in general. But it can be looser than that. I can say dogs have four legs. Well, most dogs have four legs, but they don't all. You've probably all seen three-legged dogs on occasion. But you know how to make sense of that sentence. And then you can read an encyclopedia entry that tells you that and then make inferences about it. Or I can tell you that cars have radios. And used to be in my city, New York, that wasn't always true because people removed them against the will of the owners. Um, but you still understand it. Or how about ducks lay eggs? Well, it's not even true of most ducks. Well, why not? Well, half the ducks are male. They don't lay eggs. And then some of them are too young or too old or have a disorder or whatever. So maybe it's only 30% of ducks actually lay eggs. But you understand it. You get it. You can think about it. Same thing with mosquitoes carry malaria. It might only be 5% of the mosquitoes. But if you're Bill Gates trying to save the world from malaria, this is an important fact. And you go with it. And so we can make inferences even though we don't have a statistically reliable truth. Well, children are able to understand this, but machines aren't. And so we should be looking into the eyes of children. So here's my prognosis. The field of AI appears healthier than it actually is. And the more healthy it is, the more that we do have to worry about the risks associated with AI. Again, I don't want to undermine that. But for now, we've still made little progress on making genuinely smart machines. And statistics and big data, as popular as they are, are never going to get us all the way there by themselves. Instead, the only route to true machine intelligence is going to begin with a better understanding of human intelligence. I thank you very much.